Well, if the if the standards are slowly being reduced in order to get along, we have to go along with lower and lower standards. So instead of going along with the standards, become the standard. So if you are overweight or you are broke or you have a, a bad relationship or your marriage is destroyed or you don't get along with your kids or whatever it is, those are all decisions. And people will argue. They will argue. And, and they will argue and never admit that what I'm saying is right. Yet I know I'm right. What action I do I have to take to give me the reaction I want? And if it doesn't give me the reaction I want, change the action again until you get it. But very few people do that. You know, the question that most people should probably ask is because like you said, they're fucked, but they know they're fucked. They do. If you ask them, they just don't want to admit it because what do people never want to do? Admit that they're wrong. I didn't learn anything about healthcare when I was in a doctor, when I was went to med school, nothing. I didn't learn anything about how to be healthy, how to, how to take care of the body. I learned how to fix problems and prescribe drugs. That, they used a robot to do surgery on me. Six arms hanging from the ceiling and a guy with an Xbox joystick. I shit you not. Yep. Looks like a big octopus hanging from the ceiling. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a madman, a Spartan. He's a CEO of multiple global companies. He's a coach known as Smashworks on Instagram and YouTube, Dr. Trevor Buckmeyer. Trevor, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm doing awesome, buddy. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. No, I appreciate your time, mate. I know you're sure, sure you're a busy guy. Um, so let's kick off. So going back a few years, mate, August 2021, you were coming out of hospital in a wheelchair. You were told yep. by doctors that you you wouldn't run again, that you certainly wouldn't be athletic athletic, athletic again. Um, I want to ask, did you listen? <laughs> no. No, and, <laughs> and I mean, really think about it. Like I've been a doctor for, well, now I'm 50, so 20 plus years. And it's true, we're the worst patients, number one. But the other part is, honestly... I didn't learn anything about healthcare when I was in a doctor, when I was, went to med school, nothing. I didn't, didn't learn anything about how to be healthy, how to, how to take care of the body. I learned how to fix problems and prescribe drugs. And the issue with that is, is that's emergency care, not healthcare. And I knew that. I knew when they were telling me that stuff. I'm like, you guys are lying, man. You're selling me a, a, an ideology that's not going to take me further. It's not going to help me. And you're going to end up costing me my life. And that's where you want me to stay because I'll be slightly productive in a way that allows you to take advantage of me in a way that I'm going to still be producing. I'll be, a, a, you know, a, a part of the machine. I'll be producing, you know, 40 grand a year. You'll take my taxes. I won't make enough to leave my house. I'll barely be able to take care of my family. And this is where I'll stay, but I'll never get stronger, faster, more fit or make more money, which means I won't have options. And I said, forget it. You know, I left with 12, I think it was 12 prescriptions and an oxygen machine and an oxygen tank. And they said, you're never going to. And then they filled in the blanks, run, be athletic, change your life. You have to get used to your new normal. And they slapped a disabled label on me. And I just didn't agree. So, so what was it you had when, uh, what, what put you in hospital? So originally, this is the best. So I, I mean, I got to be careful with what I say so I don't get your show banned, but you're good. Uh, they're just <laughs> weird. Like they're just so fucked up the world. Right. So they labeled me as. Uh, they said a lot of things were COVID like, which is hilarious to me, because if you look at the narrative behind that, I never had COVID never once. They did four IgG tests. And if you know, understand the tests, that is the most like perfect test to define whether or not you have something. And then they nose fucked me once and that didn't work either. So <laughs> all of that stuff is bullshit, right? But ne it never came back as COVID. And I knew that I knew that going in. I'm not an idiot. And, and of course, they want to do that because it's a half a million dollar paycheck every time they get somebody. As soon as somebody becomes a complex patient, that's almost, I mean, without getting into the, the picture, and I'm sure somebody's going to argue and send you a bunch of messages. So I hope this gives you a lot of traction. But if they <laughs> tell you that's not true, they're fucking lying. It's about a half, half a million dollars per patient once you become complicated. A complicated patient is someone that winds up in ICU. Anything, anything like that. I sat in ICU. So I went in with, uh, I, I rolled into the hospital twice in the same 24 hour window. The first time I was just really sick, myalgia, legs, bad fever and stuff. They bombed me with morphine, took the edge off. One, only one doctor in this whole place where I went, you're legit. 
He was a good doctor, really good doctor. And, uh, and they gave me some antibiotics and fluid loaded me and sent me on my way. And I felt great, uh, great relative, but significantly better than when I left or when I got there while well, it hit again at about four o'clock, I wound up in the hospital, 106 degree fever. I couldn't walk. I don't remember the drive from my house to the hospital. It was about 14 miles at the time. And we got there and my wife was my, if you've seen my wife, my wife's a beast. Like she is a savage human being. So she's so strong and she had no problem moving me around. I was leaning on her trying to walk and she was having a hard time holding 190 pounds of me up and she's not weak. So they stuck me in a chair, brought me in, checked my temperature, boom, right into ICU right away. They tried to cool me down. I could barely breathe. I was struggling with oxygen, did a CT scan, all kinds of things went on. Turned out they said the whole COVID like lie. It was turned out it was pneumonia and it was, but the problem with that is listen, Danny, the problem is that what they do is they prey on the fact that when you're scared, they decide what your diagnosis is going to be based on your fear. And I sat there and they said, they didn't let me see my wife. They didn't let me see my kids. And when I went into the hospital, I was dying. I could barely breathe. They hooked me up to oxygen and they basically had me on life support to save my life. And then they kicked my wife out of the hospital. So my wife and they had, and they locked her out. Yeah. Why did they do that? Why? Why? Because they said, well, that's our protocol. If any, it, we have COVID protocols in place, she can't be here. And my wife said when she, I still remember looking at her on the, on the little couch in the, in the ICU room. I said, it's my wife. She's been around me for, I don't know how long. This is what the nurse said. This fat son of a bitch fucked up nurse. I swear if you're listening, fuck you. <laughs> so this is, yeah, I'll tell you how I really feel. The world is filled with shitty human beings like this. They're so dogmatic, right? And She said, I told her, I go, it's my wife. If she can't stay, then that's ridiculous. And I'm not going to stay. She didn't miss a beat. She goes, fine. Then I'll, I'll inform the doctor that you're checking yourself out. I'm on life support. (laughs) So I went, are you like, I have no options. And so Brandy's like, no, no, no. Brandy's my wife's name. She goes, no, 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 babe, stay, stay. They escorted her out, locked her out and she freaked out. So she's outside hysterical talking, talking to her best friend going, I'm never going to see my husband again. He's going to die in here and they won't let me in. And they locked her out. Like they were like, do not let her in. That's the most screwed up thing I've ever heard. And like I said, being a doctor for as long as I have, I couldn't imagine doing that to somebody. So I went through, I was there for six days. They kept pressing me, get a vaccination, get a vaccination, get a vaccination. You need to take this. You need to take remdesivir. You need to take remdesivir. It was all the same thing. And if you heard me on Brad's podcast, I said, as soon as I said the word remdesivir, he went, oh, that shit will kill you. Yep. So the remdesivir remdesivir protocol is 10 days. And day nine is usually when people die. Just do the math. Do the math, right? (laughs) So if you think for a second and however people want to take this is up to them, but if you think for a second that they have your best interest in mind, for the most part, they don't, they have their finances in mind. So that bothers me. The issue is that the people that suffer, the people that come in going, please help me. And so on day, on day two, I'm at my wits end. I remember being on my stomach and this nurse was rubbing my back because I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to fucking die. And I'm crying and I'm upset. And I thought I was going to like, I was, if you understand what it's like, imagine taking a, this straw right here. And that's all you can breathe through. And now run. That's how it felt yeah. all the time. And, and people don't understand that. I go, you don't understand. It was impossible to breathe. I was struggling just to stay alive. And so I broke and I said, fine, you need to put me on remdesivir. So they gave me monoclonal antibodies, which is basically fucking anti-venom for snakes is basically what it is. And, and it's the truth, really, if you want to break it down to what it really is, it's just a reaction to somebody else's illness, right? And they gave me remdesivir. Well, they said, you need it. It'll save your life. This is what we do. So I was starting to get better before I took this. So there's something called a D dimer, which tells you how you're clotting, you know, how fast you're going to clot and how easily you're going to clot. Well, it was dropping. They gave me remdesivir and it didn't do this. It skyrocketed. 
Well, my wife, so my wife is so smart. Like she's creepy smart. And really, she is so smart and she will research and figure it out. She is, she's like Sherlock fucking Holmes. And just very deductive reasoning, right? She's extremely intelligent. And so she went down the rabbit hole and she started looking up remdesivir. Well, she sends me a message two days later. I've been on this now. Bear with me for two days. And she goes, babe, I don't think they're helping you. She goes, I think, I think we need to leave, but I'm going to do a little more research. Well, in the interim, one morning at 2.30 in the morning, this is three days in, I was for sure I thought I was going to die. And I sent her a message telling her I'm not going to make it. And I don't know how to explain it other than it felt like I was, it's overwhelming peace for, for lack of a better expl- explanation. It wasn't happy, but I felt like, all right, there's nothing I can do. I've done everything. And I sent her a message at 2.30 in the morning. It's the one and only time in 50 years of my life that I've ever done something like this. And I sent her everything I know about our life, like every, and she has it all. We have no secrets in our life and she, every password, every access, everything there was, you name it. Just so she had everything. Cause I said, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make the morning. And I really believed it. And she didn't miss a beat. She's like, uh, she sends me a message. I saved it. I read it a bunch of times. She said, I can't do this life without you. I need you. And I started crying and I got furious. And I got furious at what was trying to kill me and I turned it into something. I turned it into a someone and I went, you're going to fucking die because it's either you or me. And that's it. And I went to war. And because I thought, how dare you? How dare you fucking try and kill me? I'm not done here yet. Just because you think I don't. And I'm like, there's no way God's going to do this to me. So whatever you are, get the fuck out of me. And I went to war. And then my wife kept pressing me about how, well, not pressing me. She kept telling me, listen, I don't think they're doing good things to you. So finally, she's like, I think we need to leave. And I said, okay, now just so you understand, I trust my wife more than anybody else on the planet ever. If she says we're going to do this, I believe her. I will do what she says over anyone else, no matter what. That's uh, honestly on a, on a side note, I think that's the integrity of a good marriage is you trust your spouse. And I think that's sorely lacking now too, is people go, I don't know. Well, that's why your marriage is (laughs) fucked, right? But but that's a whole other conversation. So I said, okay. So the next day I said, check me out. And they're like, no, 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 no. They spent nine hours trying to get me an oxygen tank. And they lied about everything, changed shifts and everything. It was just one big fiasco after another. Told me I was going to die. They're like, you're going to die if you leave the hospital. I'm like, fuck, I'm probably going to survive if I leave the hospital. So I left, (laughs) came home with an oxygen tank. I couldn't function without oxygen. I couldn't do anything. I went outside. I started working out right away the next day. Nobody has ever, ever documented what I've done from start to finish. Nobody. Literally gone, here is the recipe. Here's how you do this. Which is always weird to me when they go, people go, "I, I I don't really know how to do this. I don't know if I should believe you. I've shown you from the day I've been in the hospital how to do it. It's never been easier, you know, because I I was, I haven't missed a day, 28 months. I've never missed a day on showing people how to do this. And what's crazy is people still doubt, right? Because they're like, well, I don't like what you're saying though. Is there an easier way? (laughs) There, there is the easy, the shortest distance is the work you're avoiding. Mm Mm-hmm. And so we came home, I started working out, I was on oxygen, I started to be able to reduce my oxygen, I started to get this back pain, went in for an x-ray to keep the story short, they took a picture, and there was a tumor the size of a football in my chest. Three weeks before that, that tumor didn't exist. What? There you go. There you go. Now you see? What, legitimately, it didn't exist when you went into hospital with pneumonia, and then... They give you all that shit, and then three weeks later, you got remdesivir. Cheap. So, can I 100% link that together? Of course not. But what the fuck? I'm not a smoker. And if you can find anything that cre- that has tumor creation in three weeks, show me. Show me what it is. Mm. That's not some brutal carcinogen. It doesn't exist. But if you look up the history, just look up remdesivir, and you'll see the catastrophe this stuff causes. It's not meant to hurt to help. It's meant to kill. And so I, I went in, the guy looked at the x-ray. I went in there, little white lie to my wife. I'm just like, I'm going to be fine. Don't worry. She's sitting there. She was worried because she's seen what happened. And I, uh, I came out of there and the doctor says, I was in emergency or uh, urgent care. And he says, you need to go to ER right now. And Brandy's face just goes white. 
because she knew it was coming. It wasn't going to be good. I got in and I remember saying to the doctor, okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to like aspirate it. Is it like a big pus pocket? What, what is this? Right? Like, it's okay. Do I need to lean over a table? This is going to suck, but it's okay. And he's like, Oh no, no, no. You need thoracic surgery. You, uh, you're not going home. And I almost threw up. Cause I thought like, you're not giving me knee surgery. You're going into my chest. This is where people die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for three days I got worse. My wife watched me die. They put me in an ER waiting room with a sliding glass door and COVID patients lined up the halls and they couldn't find me a doctor. They couldn't find me a surgeon. I live in Texas. Do you know how fucking big Texas is? <laughs> yeah. A lot more fucking right? bigger than the UK in just one state. Yeah. yeah. Right. So like, dude, like what? But they were like, we're going to have to, and on day three, they said, we're going to have to ship you out of state. Now, by this time I couldn't walk. I struggled to even pee. I had to pee in a cup and stay in my bed. My wife would bring me breakfast every day. And she sat there and she was basically watching her husband die. And they couldn't figure out what to do. And they said, we have to ship you out of state. I knew if I got on that plane, I was going to die. I knew for a fact, you put me in a plane, pressure changed, all that stress. I was going to die. I wasn't going to make it. So I sat there. I believe in God. I don't really care if somebody else does. And I stood there and I started talking to God. My wife had just left and I started thanking him for everything. I said, thank you for, for making me into a, a juggernaut. Thank you for giving me the best surgeon, the best doctor, like just making me, just covering me in fucking muscle, making me unstoppable, giving me like the ability to influence people and help them another 50 years with my wife, my family, my kids, just making me a badass motherfucker and giving me all the tools to do it. And then I sat on my bed. About 10 minutes later, I get this knock on my door. And the door opens and he goes, Trevor Bachmeyer. I said, yeah. He goes, just letting you know, your ride to, uh, to Dallas is going to be here in a half an hour for your surgery tomorrow. And I, I, I grabbed my phone, get the kids. I said to Brandy, I'm getting surgery tomorrow. She was there so fast. And there they were, followed me behind that ambulance all the way to the hospital, 1230 the next day, I'm in surgery. And I'm like, I, I handed her my phone and I said, film everything, no matter what. She's like, are you sure? I go film everything. She's like, okay. Yeah, that might not have worked out so well for me. Huh? But she's like, okay. I wake up from surgery. So check this out. Who you are is exposed in times of trial. You understand that, right? Mm -hmm. Who you are is exposed in times of, of success and times of adversity. And it's always the same person. Where if somebody goes, money changed him or her, and he's an asshole, he, he's always been an asshole. Money didn't change him. You know, this guy's always been a good guy. Doesn't matter what comes into his life. That guy's always going to be a good guy. Yeah. And that's what that. I believe. You are introduced to yourself in times of adversity. And so I always thought I play the game right, but there's always that 5% of you that, that runs a doubt. Everybody has that. We just do. I don't have that anymore. I'm the only person I bet on the planet that doesn't have that anymore. Because I came out, I don't remember. This is the first thing I asked for, my wedding ring. I woke up and I opened my eyes and my wife goes, that's the first thing you asked for. You weren't even coherent. And you're like, where's my wedding ring? Give me my wedding ring. Like, she's my best friend. But when I finally was somewhat coherent, the doc, I looked down and I had garden hoses coming out of my chest. Remember, I went to sleep with an anesthesiologist joking about how high he was making me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we've all been he there. Was. He, was like, yeah. Yeah. he was. All of a sudden, I'm laying there as we're going down the, the hall and I'm on the, on the gurney and, and I'm like, man, I feel really good. <laughs> and he's like, you feeling pretty good? I go, yeah. Like, I don't even think I need surgery anymore. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I gave you something. You seem pretty stressed out. So it just calmed me down a little bit. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> Next thing you know, I woke up. He goes, you're going to feel some burning anesthesia burns when it goes in. He goes, so just so you understand that burning, that's the last thing I remember. And then I wake up in this room with my wife going, hi, babe. And it's all on video. She's holding the camera and I'm like this. And I kept falling asleep mid sentence. So, and it's, it's, it's the most hilarious video ever, but I guess I asked my ring first. Well, then I look down and I see these hoses 
freak you out because they're big. Like, I mean, they're like this, two of them. And so when you go to sleep normal and you wake up different, it's not a, it's a, I can't explain it. It's a very strange feeling. While the doctor takes a knee, he comes in to check on me very fast. And he takes a knee, he says, listen, the surgery went well, took a little longer than expected. So I guess they were texting my wife while I was in surgery. My wife's pacing a hole in the concrete. They nicked my aorta. I blasted a, uh, a liter of blood like this. So think about that. If the doctor would have decided to go, can't save him, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So they fixed that. They used a robot to do surgery on me. <laughs> Six arms hanging from the ceiling. And a guy <laughs> with an Xbox joystick. Fuck off. Really? I shit you not. Yep. Looks like a big octopus hanging from the ceiling. And they use, they cut, put incisions in me, shove these that's robot what, that, arms in me. Like, well, that's why they got the artery, wasn't it? The fuck is. He's not very yeah, good at Xbox. Fuck, I know. <laughs> this probably should have been a PS5. But yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. They would have no problems then. I'm just nah, saying. They, I'm team PS5. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, what's funny is like when they told me that the nurse said, she's like, oh, it was a robot that did the surgery. I go, you mean there was an arm inside me? She goes, no, six. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking? Like I, I, I did surgery. You know what I used? A scalpel. Nope. They use joysticks. So it's wild. The tactile feedback on these things is nuts. Just to understand, like even looking at these machines. So anyway, I have these huge incisions. They're about this long, six of them all over. The doctor goes, okay, we got the, we got the mass out. Uh, we got the tumor all out. That was fine. It worked out really well. It took a little longer. He says, but we had to take your lung. He goes, we couldn't, we couldn't save it. It was too bad. It was just all destroyed by this. And I was like, okay. And I guess I'm on the video. And I was like, did you give me a new one? And he's like, no, I was like, <laughs> okay, well, so honest question. And so he goes, things are going to be different. And then he leaves and the nurse and the nurse comes over to me and she's like, do you need anything? I said, yeah, get me up. And she goes, no, you just had surgery. I'm not going to get you up. You just, you had a lung removed, man. I go, get me out of this bed. And she's like, no, I go, you can pick me up off this fucking floor or you can help me get out of this bed and walk me around. Either way, I'm getting up. And she's like, oh, okay. So there's a picture of me and my bare ass in a gown tubes coming out of my chest and a box filled with blood from me <laughs> and oxygen in me and IV lines every, I got one in my shoulder and I'm doing laps around this tiny little recovery room. And that was well, the that's day what I documented. started all videoed. And Man, I've, I've, never, watch all this. <laughs> I've, I've cool. never missed, I've never missed a day. I've never missed a day since. And so as soon as they, so I'm on a vacuum tube attached to the wall for 24 hours, right? To keep, uh, uh, so you don't get what's called a tension pneumothorax, right? So the lung doesn't collapse. And as soon as they unhooked me from that, I went, where can I go? And he's like, yeah, really, literally. I was like, where can I go in this hospital? And he says, you can stay on this floor as long as you don't go out the double doors on either end. I said, perfect. So I would do laps around the nurse's station. Like I would do laps around my room for the first 24 hours, nonstop as much as I could. And then I said, all right, I'll do laps around the nurse's station. The first time I did it, it's maybe 400 feet, I'm guessing, give or take 500 feet. And uh, first time took me over 10 minutes. I had to keep stopping because I was out of breath. It's a weird feeling because you're missing parts, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would do laps and my wife was with me and I used to wipe off all the stuff on the whiteboard that they had in my room, like all the stats and shit that they'd put on there for the next doc. And I'd erase it all and I'd write how many laps and the oxygen I was at. <laughs> it, they, they gave up on me because I it would be like, you can't write, you can't erase that. I go, well, I'm going to keep erasing it because I need to know what I'm doing more than whatever you're doing right now. Uh, I literally thought you were going to say, you just wrote, fuck you. Up there or something. <laughs> no, I was about it. That's funny because that means you know me really well. Just to fuck off. I'm going to do this anyway. But so I did it anyway. And they finally gave up like two days in. They're like, just fucking let him. He's going to keep erasing it. anyway. So I'd write how many laps, the time and what my oxygen was at. And I would do that every day. So there's this big string of numbers and all this stuff. And so I guess they, what they finally said was on like day two or three, they're like, just, just write what your your sats were uh, on on what that whatever that is because we're never going to win this i go no you're not and so by the end i was doing like 30 40 50 a day just non-stop non-stop it was supposed to be 14 days for recovery after that uh, i was home in seven okay. and yeah and i was like you're not you can't stop me you can't only i can and i chose not to because the biggest thing like 
you guys, the biggest thing that I came up with was when I, when I opened my eyes and I saw my wife and everything kind of hit me, it came to fruition in my mind. I went, my wife and my kids were screwed without me. If I passed away, they're fucked. I'm a liability. And I didn't know it. That was the 5% that I wasn't doing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm a fucking liability to my own wife, my own kids. I almost orphaned my kids and widowed my wife. Are you kidding me? I, and I'm, I, I got way more life to live and I ain't done yet. And I haven't given her the life I promised her yet. Forget it. So I said, I'm never going to miss again. And I haven't, I haven't. So I went and got to work on doing only one thing, be the baddest motherfucking asset I can. And then teach every other soft ass male who goes out there scratching their big old bellies and brushing the Oreo dust off their belly going, my life, I'm really good. No, I'm, I'm a really good guy. She doesn't care if you're a good guy. She cares that you can take care of her and that you do what you said. Because when you showed up to get married, that ain't who you are now for the most part. And that bugs me. And I realized that's what a lot of people do. And so I went, all right. So I just started, I came home and my wife goes, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work out. They pulled the tubes out of me. That's on video too. Two <laughs> foot of a garden hose. Mate, two, two feet of garden hose ripped out of my side. And it's crazy. I think it's one of my most viewed videos on, on Instagram. People just were like, oh, I'm like, oh, it <laughs> fucking hurt, man. She's funny. This nurse was great. She was, she was a pretty, she was a badass, like kind of like a savage, right? Just a bigger <laughs> lady too. And she's like, I'm on my side. And, and she's like, okay, you ready? And I was like, yeah. And then she punches me in the shoulder on the video. She goes, you're uptight. This is going to hurt. Don't do that. She goes, you got to relax. She goes, okay, big breath in blow. And she goes, wham. And she pulls out like two feet of hose out of my chest. Two of them at the same time. And I, you see me roll over and I go, did you get it? She goes, I got both. And I'm like, fuck, you're good. <laughs> it was awesome. Like it was so good. And then they made me stay there for about four hours to make sure there's no leaks. And, uh, and then I went home, but I came home and my wife says, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work out. I saw my kids, you know, I mean, I was, you guys, I was looking at my kids and my wife from a third story window through a, like through a glass window. Like that's what I, I was looking at my kids that I couldn't even touch and see my kids. What kind yeah, of fucked even up system that, is that? Couldn't even imagine that, could you? Being in that situation, like like you have, like yeah, and most people can't even imagine no, how imagine that, right? how furious I was and how helpless you feel. They took my phone, they took my stuff, and they be, I had to basically beg and plead for my own shit. I'm like, dude, this is why people come in and snap because because <laughs> you're pushing buttons and you're fucking with someone's family. Don't do that. Yeah, you know, because I promise you this: you get between a man, a real man, not some pussy soft ass trans. You some you get a, a real man and his family. That's war, but it's been that way since the beginning of time, right? And and so, yeah. I my I, I I couldn't do anything. I had these giant incisions in my chest and in my back. I still have them. These huge scars everywhere. And so I, all I could do is walk. So I took a rogue, like twenty foot strap, and I put a, yeah. a like a Valero belt, right, a weightlifting belt. Put it on me, and I looped the strap through it, and I put it on my sled. And I dropped the 45 pound pl- plate on my sled and my driveway is like maybe uh, 400, 300, 400 feet circle, gravel driveway right in front. And I told my wife, I said, come get me when I can't walk anymore. Come get me when I collapse. <laughs> and I started Fuck walking yeah. and she went into my lab, right? She watched me out the window and I would just do laps until I couldn't, until I literally physically couldn't do it. And then unhooked me, walked into the house and I go, Try again tomorrow. And that's how I started. I mean, when I first started, I got video of me with knobby, big old knobby knees. I'm all skinny, right? I mean, they rolled me out of the hospital in a wheelchair saying, you will never. And my answer was, just fucking watch me. (laughs) Keep telling me shit I can't do. I'll keep showing you that you're wrong. Because nobody believes in me more than I do. You know? What, what sort of level of maniac were you before all this happened? I, Did I you was literally go from intense. zero to a hundred or were you? No, I, like- was, I was pretty intense. Like, I mean, I was physically fit before. That's a thing. That's why I push being physical fit, physically fit above anything else. I don't care if you're, if you're worth a hundred billion dollars, if you're fat fucking slob, you're losing, you're losing. I got nothing. Winning means winning across the board. 
You win in all arenas. You don't win in one. And so the doctor said to me, he goes, listen, he goes, if you wouldn't have been in the shape you were in, this stuck with me, you wouldn't have made it. I was, I was literally just about to ask that. I was like, if you and weren't I as went, fit as you were, would you have died? That, you're right, Danny. That. That's what made me go, I will never allow myself to be less than everything. Not less than I can be, less than everything. Because people go, well, I'm okay. I'd like a dad bod's accepted. Fuck your dad bod. Dude, you at 5,000 years ago, you would have got eaten. <laughs> it's, it's fucking so right. true, isn't it? Change my mind. You wouldn't. Like 5,000 years ago, you would have got killed by something because you'd be the fat, slow one at the end of the tribe running away. So I got no sympathy for that. And I don't. When people are like, you know what? I'm, I, I'm navigating this world in a big body. You're navigating this world because of your bad decisions in a problematic state, putting absolute stress on everybody else around you that counts on you to take care of them. Fuck you. You're selfish. It's like people that talk about depression. Like you ain't depressed. There's no such thing. There's no depression. There's no anxiety. You have a situation that makes you depressed. You have a situation that makes you anxious. Fix that. That you cannot catch depression or anxiety. It's not a disease. Just like obesity isn't a disease. It's a, it's a series of incredibly poor decisions. How much of an issue is like depression and obesity in the US, mate? Because it's, uh, it's quite shit. a problem in the UK. 60 to 70% is a guess for obesity. Mm. And the That's problem is, crazy, you know what they, it? it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Because yeah. you're not designed that way, you know? And people go, well, you don't understand. Like when an airline goes, we're going to give you free seats because you're <laughs> fat. Because you're fat. Is that a thing? Shouldn't you, that a thing? shouldn't you pay more? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Southwest. Is it in the US? Southwest. Mm-hmm. Is it? Southwest Fucking said if you're over a certain weight, you get a free seat. Huh. <laughs> so let's figure that out. Let's figure that out. If your luggage is fifty more than 50 pounds, they charge you for it. But if your fat ass <laughs> is above two bills, it's free. <laughs> If you can like unpack it. that and make it make sense, I'd love to hear it because there's no such thing. It is the dumbest logic. See, you know what they're doing, right? And this is what I think is I'll they're changing. So changing the definition doesn't change the facts, right? And, and I think that's the problem is like I can take this phone and I can drop this phone a thousand times and good old Sir Isaac Newton proved that gravity is a constant. I will drop this a thousand times. It will hit the ground same speed, 9.8 meters per second per second, a thousand times. That's it. There's no variation. So if I change the definition, it doesn't change the fact that this is still going to hit the fucking floor. That's what they're doing with, with fat people. That's what they're doing with being broke. That's what they're doing with being soft and weak and depressed and anxious. They're t- and like masculinity is toxic masculinity is toxic dude my dad was such a savage man the guy would reach into a fire with bare hands move fucking logs around (laughs) i shit you not and you know what i love my my dad he was such a tough son of a bitch big old stubborn german man drank too much he died too early you know he was a great man he was definitely my my superhero and and i i love my dad and and it was a hard thing to watch him fall apart so rapidly and i watched the the decisions kill my dad end-stage liver disease did not kill my dad decisions killed my dad. He died at 67 years old, taking 16 plus Tylenol a day, drinking. He, his livers, his liver couldn't take it because a doctor, a doctor said, take as many Tylenol as you need. So my dad, Haimo, the stubborn German did not listen to his son, the doctor. He listened to Dr. Billenkoff. Fuck you. If you're watching, he killed my dad. (laughs) And it's true, man. That's I told my mom, man. don't tell me who that is. I'm glad I got a handle on my emotions because that guy would be buried. Because yeah. he said, take as many as you want. So my dad went, well, Dr. Billenkoff says, take as many as I want. So he took, well, he just was taking, he got up, fuck. 16 a day was where he ended up. So the sheer damage that Tylenol causes is unreal. I am totally fine with medication as a necessity. I'm not okay with uh, a medication as a comfort. They're not the same. You know, you don't take antibiotics for the sniffles. You take mm, antibiotics because yeah. if you don't take them, they're going, it's going to get worse. You're going to mm, die, mm-hmm. right? Like there's, they're, they're not the same. You know, there's no place in the world that says you should take something because some doctor says you should do it and it actually causes more harm. What are you doing? 
Yeah. But people think about this. The, the, the three of us on this call, I think it should be absolutely imperative that every human being knows about their own body. Why would you not? Why would you not? You ask anybody, ask anybody where their fucking pancreas is. They're going to be like, oh, I have no idea. Forehead. <laughs> yeah. They'll have no idea. But yet we pilot around this vehicle all day and we know nothing about it because they made sure that we know nothing about it. Now, I'm not saying everybody goes to med school, but you know what? Just because you know right from left doesn't mean you know anything about your body. But I made a post about changing a battery in, my, in one of my exotics and I, I actually videoed it. And I was like, dude, I just put a different battery in. It's fucking easy. It took me literally 10 minutes. And I hear people go, Pfft. I got so many people going, dude, bro, clearly you're not as rich as you say you are. You, you have to change your own battery. I go, no, I, I chose to change my own battery because I'm a man. <laughs> and number two is I know how. And if you know how when you pay somebody to do it, absolutely fine with that. But if you don't know how, dude, you're a bitch. If you can't change a tire or a battery, why are you driving a car? Right? And so I think therein lies the problem is people default to allow other people to give them the answers, trusting that those answers are going to serve the person asking the question when in fact they're actually serving the person answering the question. Yeah. And that's very expensive psychologically and it's very expensive financially, right? And that's why I tell people all the time, I go, dude, people go, oh, it must be nice. You know, you just like we, we consistently do over a million dollars a month now in, in our, uh, in the inner circle in, in my coaching program. And it's because I actually, nobody coaches like me. I'll tell you that right now. Nobody coaches like me. And it's not meant to be arrogant. It's the truth. Cause I have people, I have more people come to me from other coaching programs going, holy shit. I, I never got any of this. I got a PDF and I got some Google docs and I got a, a, a weekly call that's pre-recorded and I got an emergency call that I have to schedule a month in advance. And I never got an answer if I texted somebody and it, they passed me off to their secondary coach after I bought the program for 50 grand and blah, 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 all the bullshit. And I go, what are you doing, man? That doesn't make any sense. I go, nobody coaches like me. I answer everybody. I get on calls Saturdays and Sundays and I drop fucking bombs on how to do it. On Sunday, I go into my own companies and go, what is working right now that's actually making money, that's actually helping people, that's actually growing the company? I go, I spent two hours before my call going into that and then like, fuck, I got them all right here. Like I do this all the time. And I write five, six, seven pages. And then I teach everybody on that call how to do exactly what I'm doing. I don't gatekeep things. I don't have some weird secret group within a group. You know, oh, you have to earn your spot here. Like, fuck you. I just tell you exactly how to do it. Whether they execute or not is up to them. Hmm. But you know what? I, I, a lot of people, they, they come into these coaching programs and they go, well, is the coaching program going to do the work for me? No. That's like telling your trainer they're going to get you jacked. Your trainer tells you what to do. You decide to do it or not. And that's where people really struggle is because they don't, I, you get somebody that bumps from trainer to trainer to trainer or coaching program to coaching program. It's because they're waiting for the next one to give them the answer that they like. See, they keep asking the question and people ask a question more than once for only two reasons. Either one, they didn't like the answer or, or two, <laughs> they just weren't fucking paying attention because they're too busy in their own little head thinking about everything else. Hmm. Those are the only two reasons. So I always, when somebody asks me a question or I see them bouncing from program to program, I go, you are waiting for it to be easier. You don't like the answer. That's the problem. You know, it's easier. Just do the work. Yeah. So that's why when people hear the amount, they're like, do you do a million a month? Must be nice. I go, it is pretty fucking nice. Cause I worked for it. <laughs> I started my company with tubes coming out of my chest in the hospital. <sighs> did my you start it after you come out? Was you, was you doing it before that or was it? Just no. it's after. Did you start yep. the Spartan Army after? After. In. In. <laughs> All right. So the Spartan Army, though, is it is it like an online health and fitness platform or is it yeah. more like lifestyle coaching or what well, is it? All of it. No, that's the right. That's the right way. Of, that's the right question, Danny. So it's it's mindset. It, because listen, I don't care. You could have all the tools in the world. If your brain says it should be easy, you're screwed. Because that's <laughs> yeah. what people do. Or they go, dude, you feel I feel like I'm being attacked. Huh. you know what? Accountability always feels like an attack to people hiding behind their excuses, dude. Maybe stop hiding behind all your lies. 
Like that's the problem is they, they're unwilling to look at the truth because the truth demands accountability in the moment. And it's very uncomfortable because it causes conflict in the moment, but it, it causes success in the, in the future, right? Distraction causes success in the moment and conflict in the future. And that's usually where people live. So I created this program because I went, people started asking me, like Danny, they were asking, they were like, how did you do this? How did you get so fit? How did you fix everything? How did you go from the wheelchair? Because I mean, I got video of me rolling out of the hospital in a wheelchair, all scrawny, you know? And I was like, because I, number one, I made the decision to not accept where I was. And that was the first thing I had to do. And people were asking, they're like, well, what's your mindset? What, what's your nutrition? What's your training program? So I built the Spartan army because I got, honestly, I got tired of everybody going, can you just build me something? You can pay <laughs> me for it because this is a lot of life and work that I did. But at the same time, I went, you know what? When people pay, they pay attention. When people don't, I don't want you. If you want it for free, I, I don't want you, man, because you're not going to respect it. Yeah. You that's, know? that's a huge point, mate. That is such a huge point because if people don't pay, they don't respect it. They? they don't want to no. do it. They don't see the value in it. They don't fucking bother no. with it. And then they complain about it anyway, right? Like people will be like, oh, dude, it's it's 50 grand for this or 20 grand for that or whatever it is. And then they go, fuck, that's expensive. Do you have like a $30 program? And my answer is <laughs> always, do you, do you have a $30 life? Because that's all I'm hearing is you want the cheapest thing on earth. But if you needed cardiac surgery, you're going to find the cheapest surgeon or the best. But yet yeah, people don't time. do that until they're at their last, they're, they're on their last you know, leg of the journey. They're, they're just literally at their wits end. That's when they start going, I don't care. Like Steve jobs would have written a check for his entire fortune for one more day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. it's on that last day that he realized that it's always the same hindsight's 2020. And so I went, I don't want to be that. I promised my family something and I'm not going to be a, a liability to my family. So I went, I'm going to do everything possible to make sure that God forbid something happens. My wife and my kids never have to worry. And that means I have to become the best in of myself. And, and I think there's a lot of people out there coaching. God, it's the coaching world is unreal right now because everybody's a fucking coach apparently. And, <laughs> and half of them, half of them, probably 90% of them. I'm like, dude, I think, I think, I honestly think this. You should have to show tax returns and bank accounts that are audited and a company audit that you've actually done eight figures or nine figures before you even open your mouth and to, to tell somebody how to make money. You need to have a good <laughs> yeah, track record with, with your marriage before you start telling people how to have a relationship. You know, and if you're 21 years old and you're teaching people and you're like, I'm going to teach you how to be jacked. Fuck, dude, you're 21. You better be jacked. If you are a fat slob or if you have a big giant recovery story from going from 18 to 21 where you were a fat drinker and now you're 21 and you're fit. Fuck, I want to slap your parents because they didn't raise you right. You should be fit at 21. You know, so I, I think I built the Spartan army because people wanted answers and nobody was solving all of the problems at once. So I went, I'll do it. So I built the Spartan army and then the business grew so fast and so big. People went, hey, can you give me a little business advice? So I created the inner circle and the inner circle is just business. I go and every everything. <laughs> I don't even let you join my program if you don't do fitness. <laughs> I, I go, here's the fitness program part of this. And they're like, oh, I don't want that. Cool. Then I'm not coaching you. Why? Because if you're not jacked and fit, I ain't coaching you. You're worthless. And people get all mad. I go, you're useless. Because And <laughs> people get amazing. so offended about that. I go, it's your right to be offended. It's also my right to offend you. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's not meant to be disrespectful. I think the highest yeah. level of disrespect is to allow yourself to be the lowest version of, each, of yourself. Right. And I think that in that right there is the answer. Our job is to be the highest version of ourself who we see in the mirror and go, I love that person. That person's doing amazing and not be lies, not look at ourselves and validate our situation and our condition instead improve our situation and condition and then show people who aren't there how to do it. And people don't want to do that because they go, are you telling me what to do? No, what you're doing isn't working. And it's not like you get called an asshole for telling people the truth. Right. Like, which, like, imagine the three of us are all hanging out and, and Paul, you're like, okay, man, Trev, I'm going to be up at four 30 in the morning. 
I'm going to run every day. I'm going to do one mile every day, 430 in the morning, a weekend, five o'clock. I roll by Paul's house and he's still not outside. (laughs) What's this? So I show up the next day, 420, break into Paul's house, come into his bedroom on his forehead. And I go, hey, yo, it's four o'clock in the morning, man. You promised. Get up. We're running. And he goes, mate, you're a fucking asshole. And I go, yeah, I'm the best (laughs) asshole you got because I'm holding you accountable. Get up. And then we go running versus a friend that goes, oh, you haven't run for a while? I totally get it. You're a busy guy. You got a family. You got a business. You were up till two in the morning every day this week. Yeah, I get it, man. It's okay. Take it a little easy. Let's start running next week. That's not a good friend. So you know what? The world needs an asshole like me. So I'm going to get a shirt. I'll be your asshole. I think the world needs more bullies. Bullies that make you become a better version of yourself, not bullies that shit all over you. Because now you're called a bully for holding somebody accountable. Oh, fine. I'll be your bully then. Because I I think the problem is a lot of these coaches, they preach this life. And social media is so great because it's a highlight reel that can be manufactured. It's not even real rolling around in their basement, heating up hot pockets, live with their mom. They got a couple of hundred dollar bills on the bed. They take some video, make a TikTok out of it. And everybody's, oh, you're rich. Yeah, sure you are. Let's see your bank account and your last year's uh, your, your PL for your last three months. Show me your trail in six, motherfucker. And let's see where we're at because I'll show you mine. I guarantee you it's going to be over six million. What's yours? You know, and, and so I think what I did is I created something where there was a vacuum. I think men were, everybody has this, how to be a manly man program. And I think a lot of people aren't doing it right. They're, they're talking about, they're just doing a lot of talking. I make people work and I don't, I have a hard line. I had a guy offer to double my fee for a program, an elite program. I only take 10 people in this program. And he's like, I'll double it if you take me, but I don't want to do the fitness portion of it. This guy's he's net worth is $140 million. He doesn't need any money, but he goes, he's like, I don't want to do it. I'll double it. And I said, no. He went off on me like a firecracker, (laughs) cursing and swearing, calling me like literally, I could fucking buy you and your life sucks. You would wish you had my money, blah, 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 like nonstop. And I was, I literally went like this. Cool. (laughs) 43 messages. What was he so against the exercise, do you think? He just didn't want that. He wanted me to help his marriage of 22 years and get his headspace right because he was like, I'm ready to jump out of my building. And I was like, fucking jump then. Jump. You'll jump fat. Enjoy. We can sit here and agree with you that a lot of that would be fixed with physical fitness. And it's just insane that people His don't see life. that link. Listen, mm. listen, to your, your wife, I, I would tell everybody this. I go, I'll say this to every man out there who's sloppy. I'll be like, dude, your wife doesn't want a replacement. She doesn't. She wants the fit, ripped up version of you. She wants the rich, driven, successful version of you. She wants the confident like stoic manly motherfucker of you. She doesn't want someone else when you're like, oh, yeah, she probably wishes she had that guy over there, like fucking Juan out there doing my pool or whatever it is. Like, no, she doesn't. <laughs> the problem is Juan's working harder than you are and he's showing it. So I think a lot of times people send their representative to their marriage and then a year later they really show up. And it's that fat sloppy person, right? But this guy, he sent me 43 messages. 42 were nothing but swears. Basically like, (laughs) fuck you. I hope you die. Like just like angry, vicious (laughs) messages. And finally, he's like, literally last message. I'll I'll, I'll send it to you guys later. He goes, (laughs) okay, you're right. (laughs) Well, then he joined. I sent him a message back. Can you get on a call? He goes, yeah, I got time tomorrow. And I went, now? He's like, got it. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> what uh hey man sorry about that i go don't apologize makes you look weak i go here's the deal that was lesson number one click that's it and he started with me wired the money and then i oh and i sent him a message i said double right and he said yep cool <laughs> Jen, Jen, jen's waiting for the wire he did so he did. double and the exercise yep yeah, nice because one, I, man. I, you know what he said? He goes, nobody's ever talked to me like that or made me 
made me change and and made me like back down from my ideal my idea my ideologies and he said and he goes that's my problem he goes is i've always been able to buy myself out of everything how's he getting on now good really good yeah he's you know yeah, yeah 79 pounds he's lost he's so much happier <laughs> he feels better he looks fucking good like it's one of those things where like and he messages me almost every day his wife is in my program like he's a good dude but it changed his life right and it's not see i think that's the problem is it's never a nobody has a magic fitness program nobody all everybody's got the same fitness program pick up every shit put them down basically right like it's not that complicated stop eating like an asshole and you're fine like it's not hard they complicate it because it's easier to sell because it sounds like something new but it's not just do the basics and you're fine what they're paying for is the implementation and the person that they see and they go, you have solved all the problems in your life that I have. I'm going to listen to you. And that's what makes you valuable. If you haven't solved any problems, you have no worth. If you haven't done anything of note that has caused success, created success, if you haven't acquired the hard things, it is very difficult to respect you. Mm. Yeah, very true. And, and and I, I think that's it. That's why when people go, dude, you have the nice cars, the nice house, the fitness, the great family, the love, the business, all that stuff. Well, because they required the work. There's respect there. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And, and do you think this is like the issue with a lot of blokes then? Because the, the, the world has become so easy for people, um, for, for, for men and women. But it's, it's just, I don't know. It seems, I mean, the UK is pretty bad. I think the US is, but obviously suicide rates in men through the roof. Um, they, they seem to be missing purpose and they, you know, they, they can't, they, they seem a million miles away from, from where you're talking and where you're pitching this at. Yeah. They're, they're disconnected from value, right? So I think what's being, what's being sold is to live within labels and distraction, right? Because people have become more attached to the label they receive than the purpose they should have, right? So I, I think the issue is if someone labels you as obese, someone labels you as a depressed person, as an anxious person, as a, you're labeled as a um, middle-class citizen, it doesn't matter. Whatever your label is, that's what people become. And that's the identity they adopt. And then they fight. They will fight with irrefutable logic inside their own brain and deliberate with an entire jury to stay there just to avoid having to admit that they're wrong. Instead of going, you know what? I need help. I don't know how to get out of this. What's required? And then somebody goes, this is what's required. But their logic says, yeah, but I'm going to keep doing the same thing. I'm just going to do it harder. Well, what you have done has gotten you to where you are right now. You can do it as hard as you want. It's never going to change. It's never going to elevate you. You have to be willing to do the things that you're not doing right now that are much more difficult that you don't even know how to do where all the stressors and all the garbage is going to show up. You have to be ready to take all of that on without any knowledge of what's going to show up, just sure as fuck that it's going to work out. That's what you have to be willing to do. And I, I think for the most part, men have lost that. Women have lost that. Everybody's lost that ability in the world for the most part because they go, well, what, what, what's my guarantee? Your guarantee doesn't exist, but here's what's interesting. If I set out on a task with a purpose, I think the, the reason people succeed in life is because they constantly have a, a, a destination that they never achieve. Never. You're never going to. They have this island off in the distance that they keep swimming towards all the time. And on their way, they hit spits and sandbars and islands all the way, nonstop. And all of those are check are, are like check boxes and, and success all along the all along the path. Hey, I made a million. Hey, I made 10 million. Hey, I had one kid. Hey, I had three children. Hey, I became fit. Hey, I ran a marathon. Hey, I became this. I became that. I did this. I did that. Those are all things along the way. But you keep going, I just, I just need to get to that island though. I just, I just, it's right there, just dangling that fucking carrot in front of me every time. I just want, I'm going to get it. Swear to God. And that drive is what makes you enthusiastic about chasing it. Because without that enthusiasm, it's what you said. There's no purpose. And the purpose is reaching that island, but you're never going to get it. You just, and you know that you're probably never going to get it, but it's always something that you're going to get. The way I can, I always tell people, this is how you know if you're going to succeed is when you're climbing the mountain in the middle of climbing the mountain, you're already looking to see what's behind it then you're going to succeed because you're already looking for the next challenge because people think they're going to get to the top of the mountain. They're going to be, that's it. 
But that's like saying, listen, I got fit and I got jacked and I'm super strong now. I'm going to stop working out and go eat milk duds and fucking cheeseburgers all day. The <laughs> problem is you're not going to do that. And then they sit there and they go on social media and they start posting about their big old beers and their and their, and their the, some you know big pair of tits behind them on a bar or whatever the hell it is they're doing. And they're like, oh, my life sucks. You made it that way because you have no purpose. Purpose is what gives you value because it allows you to, to take on tasks that you normally wouldn't take on. And achieve them because you will be much more resourceful in finding a solution than you are resourceful to finding a distraction. People will do everything they can to find a distraction. And then they live in the distraction and validate why that's much more sensible, right? They sit there and they talk about how, well, listen, you have to be able to, you have to go along with everybody. Your job is to get along. No, it's not. I'm the deviant of the bunch and I will go every other direction except where they're going. Because every time I've gone along with the masses, it's fucking cost me. (laughs) <laughs> right. But we're taught as a, at a very young age. And, and Paul, this is to come to your question full circle. We're taught that in order to go to, to get along, we have to go along. Hmm. Right. Well, if the, if the standards are slowly being reduced in order to get along, we have to go along with lower and lower standards. So instead of going along with the standards, become the standard that everybody else seeks to become. And with that is the price that most people are unwilling to pay. And that is that the barrier to entry and the price that you're going to pay to be successful and be the high standard is the hate you're going to get from the people that love you the most. Yeah. I love that analogy about the island. We've often talked about this where we've, I think Danny even said that he he was worried he had a problem because he's always looking for the next thing to try and achieve and do. Best thing you can ever do, Danny. Yeah. yeah, I've always been like it, mate. Always, always Good. been like it. My wife genuinely Stay thinks I've that got some way. sort of fucking issue, you know, yeah. because I can't see trying better myself, better myself, better myself. And uh, yeah. yeah, she just always says, as long as you, got you don't issue. see, as long as, as long as you don't trash talk yourself along the way, right? I think what happens is people wake up in the morning and they, they, the first thing they do is they grab their phone and they seek validation, acceptance and approval for 16, 17 hours from people that just would never come to rescue them from people that don't matter. And, and I think there's no value in that because they put value into vanity and metrics of likes and follows and hearts and all that stuff. But none of that has value. I know people that have 400 followers that make $3 million a year. And I know people that have a million followers that haven't made more than 32 grand a year in three years. It has no, there's no value in that. There's no, there's nothing in that whatsoever. And yet it's, they understand that the psychology behind, see, people will fight to defend their own importance. And so they put their own value into those little tiny hearts and the number on the top of their screen. Except what they don't understand is that has value to the people that think monopoly money also has value. Hmm. Neither one of those have any value because when you look in the mirror and you go, I damn know, I I damn well know who I am. That's value because you're unstoppable. See, I think the, the reason people suffer so much and their standards are so low is because they're willing to give themselves options. I don't have, I, I tell everybody, I go zero out your options. Like when people, I just did a coaching call before this and it was the, this a husband and a wife and they joined my, my, the army and they said, listen, here's the deal. I go, here's how I coach just so you understand. I look at your life and I go, how do I absolutely fuck your life up? And they just went, they, yeah, they literally went, that's no coaching. Like I have, I said, nobody coaches like me. I told you, I said, but how do I completely fuck up your life? How do I screw up your marriage? I fucking screw up your dogs, your kids. i make you bankrupt and broke. I ruin your business. I screw up your house and you guys are living on opposite sides of the country in a cardboard box under a bridge. How do I do that? And I said, and then we find all those holes and we fix them because nobody else is willing to expose the holes. They go, what are you doing really well right now? Let's double down on that. Yeah, but you're leaving yourself wide open because I promise you this. If you have a great, if you're a fighter, I've been fighting forever. If, if you're great at throwing strikes, but your ground game sucks, I'm going to beat your ass because I'm going to tie you in knots because <laughs> I'm just going to take you down with a double leg and put you in a, I'll put you to sleep. Right. But people don't Mm -hmm. understand that you have to find the holes. Yeah. But you have to be willing to look at the holes in yourself. And a lot of times people's ego doesn't allow them to do that because they go, I don't want to see where I'm really bad. That's the best thing you can do is look where you're screwing up and then fix it. Not look where you're screwing up and then go, oh, my life sucks. Where are the pills? 
right? And I think that's the problem is people are now going, I have no purpose because they're trying to get along with everybody, seeking validation from people that don't matter. Instead of deciding what do I want with my one spin on this planet and I need to make sure that I have no options except that. And when you zero out your options, you're an unstoppable man. And and it's always the same. Do what you say. That's all you have to do is do what you say. When you keep your word, when the words that come out of your mouth have intent and you you don't say anything that you're not going to do. Like if I said, you listen, Paul, Danny, uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go to Starbucks. I'm going to get another coffee as soon as I get off of this. And I don't, I'm a fucking liar. So I do it. Even if I didn't want the coffee, I'm like, well, I told Paul and Danny, I'm going to do it. I have to go do it. They're never going to know. It doesn't matter. I will. You got to send us a photo now, mate. Yeah, right. Because right, now I yeah. said I'm going to do it, right? Yeah. Fuck, yeah. of course. <laughs> but the truth is, but it's the truth though. And I yeah. think people would get mad at the accountability that you just said, except that's what a good man does. Hold you accountable until they know they don't have to hold you accountable anymore because you do it yourself. But that's what makes people call you an asshole. Oh, this guy's an asshole. He's always checking up on me. No, he's making sure you're doing what you said. But your word, if your routine and your word never changes, you're lethal. You're absolutely lethal because if your circumstances are catastrophic or your circumstances are advantageous and your routine never changes, you are a very, very lethal man because you always do what you say, no matter what your circumstances are. And very few men are like that. And that's what I teach people to do in the Spartan army is I go, dude, mean the words that you say, if you do just that, you cannot be stopped. You can't. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, mate. I think it's so true. Going back to the purpose thing as well. I mean, you know, when Danny and I have talked about this previously, I think part of it comes from, you know, our upbringing. So you know, we grew up in fairly deprived areas in the UK and sure. grew up fighting in the streets. And, you know, I've, I've done martial arts for years. Danny's sort of found it a bit more recent, but we've kind of had, you know, it's not been, it's, it's you know, we've, I think we can both agree that nothing's ever been given to us. So, so we're aware that we need to work hard and, and we work well together because we hold each other accountable. But I feel like some of that, that's like an accumulative effect because I, I pissed away my 20s um, cause it took me years to figure some of this shit out and I'm, I'm still not a finished article by any means. I've still got a long road ahead of me, but I just think for, for, for sort of younger men and younger people, I don't know. It just feels like they're fucked. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> fucked. Well, what, what do you say to, to those, those younger generations that are trying to fucking find, find some purpose and just make a start? I think the, what they need to do first is look at who they're hanging out with and where they're getting their information from. Because do you ever notice that people always, this is what people tend to do, especially the younger generation. Like we're talking 18 to 25, 30, they're doing the same things all the time. And that is they have this, this dogmatic view of, of things and they have this paradigm that they live in, but they never question why. So they're like, why this is, well, this is why it is. Yeah, but why? Well, I think that's what they should do. Why? And if you really drill down, they never do that. They do it because somebody else said it. See, anytime something happens in my life, I always go, wait a minute, why am I thinking that? And most people aren't willing to go, why am I thinking that? Why am I acting that way? They're too busy going, well, this is how I'm going to do it. So they they become an, an NPC. They become much more reactive than they do active in their own life. And I think what ends up, like what people need to do is look at the life they want. Young people go, what do I want? What are the, what are the, what are the reactions I want in my life? Like if they're constantly getting shit on, they're constantly being trash talked, they're constantly being ostracized or they're sitting with low standards or they're eating food to get fat or they're, like they're living inside a video game. They're stuck inside the fucking matrix with Google, goggles on, whatever the hell it is they're doing. And they go, is that the reaction I want? If the answer is no, then they don't go, how do I change that? They go, how do I change the action that's causing that reaction? What action is required by me to create the reaction I want? And nobody looks at it that way. What what action do I have to take to give me the reaction I want? And if it doesn't give me the reaction I want, change the action again until you get it. But very few people do that. You know, the question that most people should probably ask is, because like you said, they're fucked, but they know they're fucked. They do. If you ask them, they just don't want to admit it because what do people never want to do? Admit that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So they would rather fight. The sky is blue. They're going to be like, fuck no, it's red. Uh, Are you colorblind, dude? They will argue till they die. 
because they just don't want to be wrong. But the question they should probably ask themselves is, what is one thing I could do right now that I know that I could do right now that would change my life for the better? That if I did it right now would change everything about my world. What is one thing? People try and do everything. Do one and then do the next one because you just said it, Paul. It's a cumulative effect. The day you started is not nearly where you are now. People ex- see, people expect to start their life at the finish line, and I think that's a, lo- a huge problem. They go, well, I want, I want the medals and I want the trophies, but you aren't showing up to the practice. And it's a common disease right now because people are given so many things. Fuck, my son wasn't allowed to play dodgeball and tag at school because it was too violent. You should have seen the shit we did when I was a kid. I'm sure we, I'm sure we were the same. Mate, I, I found out the other day, my son's not allowed to shower in school after rugby. I was like, what the fuck? He's covered in, come on the other day, covered in mud. Covered in mud under his school clothes. He had it in his I'd first kick period. His ass. I'd kick and my he's, kid's and ass. And he's not fucking allowed to shower. He's not allowed to shower in school. I was like, what do you mean? He's not fucking loud. They're not allowed to get their dicks out in front of each other and fucking shower. That's the weirdest they, thing, it's man. Like, it's like, so I always think weird, about this. It? Fuck, Danny, and, and you're exactly like me, man. You're just a fucking man. Like when I was at, when I was a kid, I'm like, listen, there is only plumbing that's only outdoor or indoor plumbing. That's it. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Well, I, just, I just think it make more of a thing than it needs to be. Do you know what I mean? If they make it natural, not cares, all man. weird. Like, like I remember my school teacher, I used to be like, right, strip off, get in the fucking showers. Like, that's all it was. That's what we would do. You know what I mean? We'd be scared. Well, that, all right, yeah, all right. Get our tiny little peckers out. Not grown much since, but do you know what I mean? If you make it, if you make it a thing, it's a thing. Yeah. 100%. If it's not a thing, it's not a thing. But he's going to grow up now always doing that even as he grows into an adult he's always never, now gonna be really him. conscious of of showering yep. in front of other people or men or whatever and he'll think it's odd if someone whips their dick out won't he he'll think it's weird which he shouldn't he shouldn't Dude, think it's weird because, mushroom you know. stamp him right in the head so it's like <laughs> it's but honestly you have to think about it this way if you're afraid of something it makes it even harder to do it makes it much worse and i realize it sounds like such an obvious statement but people live their life in fear and they're afraid of things that are have no basis in reality dude honestly are you gonna die if you walked out of your house fucking naked no so what people might look at you and go well, that's a little fuck that's weird <laughs> but that's as far as it would go if you make it a thing then it becomes a thing and so that's how people treat their life though right like are you kidding like i'm 50 mr craig and i still remember my gym teacher this guy I, I we had one fat girl in our whole class that's how i that's how few there were Nobody was fat when I was a kid. Hell, we were all undernourished farm boys. I was thinking, like, no, there wasn't a lot when I was a kid. Like, no, we was see all what skinny I mean? Now you're thinking, right? Nobody was fat. So, oh, really? and, and so I remember this, Couple. like, this one girl was fat, but I won't say her name because I still remember her name too. She's going to be like, oh, it's probably a complex. You know, it's funny. She's probably hot as fuck now, right? So that's right. one of those people, right? <laughs> but here's, here's what I remember. He's the kind of gym teacher that would look at you if you were fat. And I've said this many times. You're fat, work on it. And then he'd work you like a rented mule. And then he'd call your parents and go, hey, listen, you got peanut butter and jelly and Oreos and fucking cookies and a Coke in your son's lunch. What's the matter with you? And nobody would say shit. But I'll say that's a good man. Now that's an actual fired. caring fucking person, isn't it? That's fucking someone caring. You know what I mean? If you that's, didn't give a fuck, you wouldn't do it. You just said it. My, my daughter, my, my daughter and, and my wife and I, we had a conversation and my daughter's like, cause we are, I'm, we're hard on our kids in a good way because I love my kids. And you know what? We have rules. You know why? Cause the confines allow you to perform, right? No guardrails, no performance is fucking chaotic stupidity, right? Especially as a teenager, you're an idiot. You suffer from like hormone poisoning. So you, you, we give her, we give her these rules and confines and she's like, oh, you don't care. And I'm like, motherfucker, we're the only ones that care because we actually make you do this. The ones that, that you're like, oh, well, their parents don't care what they do. Yeah. What were the two words you said at the, the beginning of that sentence? Don't care. Exactly. We do. But see, I think that's it. A lot of people just don't care. And so yeah. what ends up happening is they look for distraction because it makes them feel like they have value. But the distraction, when the distraction's gone, their life is still in the same place. See, and so if you are overweight or you are broke or you have a, a bad relationship or your marriage is destroyed or you don't get along with your kids or whatever it is, those are all decisions. And people will argue. They will argue. And, and they will argue and never admit that what I'm saying is right. Yet I know I'm right. 
I've been married 18 years. My wife is my best fucking friend. We have two incredible kids. We have, I met my wife when I was broke and they gave me nine months to live 18 years ago. And she sat across from a table. And when I said, I got to tell you something, Brandy, she goes, is it about cancer? And I went, yeah, that's really weird. How'd you know that? And she says, well, everybody at the gym has told me you're not doing so well. They saw you coughing up blood in the lockers and you're not doing so well. And they find the bloody to- towels in the, in the you know, hamper and stuff. And they're like, you're not doing so well. And I was like, yeah, they gave me less than my nine months to live. I have stage three B non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she didn't miss a beat. She goes, I don't care. She goes, I just don't care. She goes, if I get two years or two days or two months, she goes, I want all your time. She goes, I'm here to be your angel. I'm here to save you. I've never forgotten it. And she said that I barely knew her. It says my angel on, on her ring, on her wedding ring uh, or on her uh, engagement ring. But I, I just teared up when she said that I was like, fuck three months later, we were engaged three months after that we were married and I've never dated anyone since. So, so you had cancer before again, four times. I think you're right, man. I think someone is trying to kill you. Fucking four times. You've had cancer four times. So check this out. Here's how I look at it. No, Paul, I don't think that. I think my vision is so big, I keep getting challenged. So here's what I here's what I know. So when I was like, I have a huge vision. If I told you exactly how big my vision is for what I think is going to happen to me in my life, in my world, in my family, you guys would be like, holy shit. Go on, tell us. But you know, it's you know, it's wild. Is check this out. I think what happens is people have goals and targets, and I'll say targets instead of goals because I think goals get a little get a little weak and it's kind of cliche. But you set targets because you know why? You know what happens when you set a target? You set a target and then you bomb the fuck out of it. That's what you do with a target. Really. And I think when you set a target and you miss the target, do you get any value out of it? No. It was a war it was a wasted bomb. It was a wasted effort. Right? So you set targets. But when you set a target, the universe and God goes, okay, here's the challenge that you have before that. Show me, prove it. Are you worth it? Can you have it? Earn it. And you get presented with all the work and all the stress and all the struggle that is required to overcome, to make of you a new person, to earn that position. Because all of the stuff, like you have a vision, you have a vision. Everybody has a vision. And what happens is people see all these, they get presented with challenges. Well, the level of your vision is going to be predicated on the, or the, the level of your challenges is, is exactly what you see, you know, depending on how big your vision is. If your vision is huge, well, it's going to be predicated on a bunch of really big challenges. And I think people get presented with the challenges. They go, oh, fuck that. I don't want to do this. They quit. And so now they go back to what you said, Paul, they have no purpose because they're scared of the challenges required, the tasks required, the cross you're required to bear up the hill to get to where you want to go. And people are unwilling to do that. Now, men 25 years ago, all fucking day long, baby. They'd get that cross. They'd be like, strap that fucker on and put somebody else on there too. I got you. I'll help you up. That's how we were. That's how we were as a society. Men were men and they would help other people. And it's not helping little old ladies cross the street. It's being a man and protecting people and being the best version of themselves. Because I always think somebody's watching right now and you are, and somebody you don't even know, You don't even know that they can see you and you don't even know that they see you every day at that coffee shop or that they see you drive down the street at the same time every day. You don't even know, but you're so fucking selfish that you will allow yourself to be, be this sloppy fuck that hates their life, knowing that what nobody else is looking and you only think about yourself except the influence you were having on that person is going to tell them that it's okay to be that way. And they're going to look at you and they're only going to come to one of two conclusions. Either you are the story of what to do or you are the story of what to avoid. And you know what people do? They go, well, I guess it's okay for them. So I guess it's okay for me because they are taught what? In order to get along, you go along. It's all connected. So I think what, what the challenge you get is based on your vision. My vision was so fucking big, like huge. Like we're talking, it makes Tony Robbins look small. <laughs> And so really, like I just, I'm going to, I told, uh, I told my wife, I said, here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to burn the eyes out of everybody that's trying to rob and fuck up people's lives. And I'm going to scorch the earth with their fucking bones. Every one of those shitbag coaches, those lying motivational guys that do nothing because they're just telling stories, but they're not actually doing it. The people that are talking about one life and not living it in their own life, dude, I'm going to 
oh, if I'm gonna suck out your retinas and scorch the planet with your car, <laughs> because and I'll because I just it's disgusting to me because people look at you and count on you because they don't have as much drive and self worth as you do, and they're looking to you to go. I want to have some self worth, and you don't even have any for yourself. You're a fraud, and so I think that. I got the challenge when, when I got, when they get, when I said, listen, you have cancer, man, this, this, just this most recent time. It's because God went, all right, show me, show me how bad you want it. And the other part about that is you get presented with a lesson that you didn't get. And I think I kept wanting something massive in my life and the challenge would just show up and I'd balk at the challenge. And so God went, I'm going to show you again. You're not going to like it. And it gets worse every time until you pay the fuck attention. And that I've seen many times in my life and in other people's lives. And here's the deal. When I looked at my wife and I opened my eyes and I said, she'd be fucked without me. I also realized, all right, God, I get it. Cause I don't get to do this again. The next mistake I make, the next screw up I make, I die. I don't have another lung and I won't make it. So I don't have, I, I can't afford to make a mistake anymore. I can't afford to miss. And most people unfortunately don't get that. They don't get it. They keep making mistakes and they keep paying the price and then they blame the world and, and society and their neighbor and their dog and their wife and their husband for their own problems. When in fact it's their own lack of action. When you have a vision, you immediately have the ability to attain it. Most people just don't like all the work involved to get it. See, it's like, here, you want a cake? Cool. Here are all the ingredients. And they go, oh, fuck, I just wanted the cake. <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem. Except it's the work involved that instills the worth. Because when you have a vision, all that work that is showing up, all the challenges, like, like I said, like cancer, stress, we've been broke. I, I, I lived in my car. Like I have had nothing to the point where like I had to steal food at a grocery store, right? It's not something I'm happy about, but I had to do it, you know? And, and so I look at all these things that I've been through in my life. Like when I met my wife, I was so broke. She had to pay all my bills and she told me she had to pay for everything. I couldn't pay for my life. And she said, and she goes, one day I'd really like to live on a farm. And, and I, she had all these books on Italy everywhere. And she's like, I, I'd like to go there one day. Well, guess where we got married? Italy. It's crazy you say Italy. Cassie's just been saying to me, my, my wife wants to go to Italy so bad. It's our 20 year anniversary next year. So that's, San that's Gimignano where is where we got married, just outside of Florence. And it was like, I basically surprised her and we got married in Italy and it was the most badass thing in the world. Because And I was broke. I came back, I had $300 in a sock drawer. I spent every dime to do that because I knew, I knew, don't worry, I'll figure it out, I'll do it. But even when she said, I want to live on a farm, I want to have land, I mean, it's fucking expensive as shit. So all this stuff, and I had nothing. I had no idea how I was going to do it, none. But I knew I was, and I went, okay. And I got to work 18 years ago on doing that. Well, two years ago, we locked that down, no problem, and then some. We've got multiple now. But the point is, is that I never stopped believing it was something that I was going to do. And, I, and with all my fucking heart that it was going to happen. And anytime a challenge showed up, I stopped walking away from them. And if I didn't, I always got smacked. I, dude, I got kicked in the dick so many times every time I walked away. So this last challenge that came up when I got, when God went, you didn't get the lesson. Your vision's big, man. I gave you this opportunity. Let me show you again. Let's make sure you're paying attention. And I got slapped. And so I don't have an, I don't like, I have to zero out my options. I don't have another option anymore. And I think that's what people do is they give themselves too many options to do anything but what's required. And then they wonder why they're not where they want to be. It's because you took the path to do something less. And then you validated why you're there and said, it's not that bad. Like when people say, well, I didn't really want that car. I didn't really want that house. You don't have to scale. Scaling is stupid. Why would you scale your business? I lost my family because of my business. I lost my wife. I didn't like, and it was evil. First of all, if you don't scale your business, you ain't making money. First, this is just common sense. And second of all, the business, the money, the phone calls, the sales calls, the gym, none of that cost you your relationship. Look in the mirror, you fuck. You did because you didn't include them. That's it. That's all it is. You just didn't include them. 
Like my wife is part of my life in everything we do. She is part of everything we do. My wife is sitting over in the, in our great room over there outside of my lab. And she is involved in everything I do because it's important. Cause we have one thing that we say to each other, anything you want, babe, you want to know the marriage? That's it. And people laugh. There's always some dude. So seriously, does that mean anything? You want? Yeah, it does mean anything you want, but that's not why we're saying it. It's because we are always on each other's team and it's us versus the fucking universe. And, and I think that's another part of purpose that's missing. People get into relationships without understanding the true purpose of a relationship. They get into the, they get into a business because they want the Lambo, not the true purpose of the business. You get into the business to solve problems. You will have nothing but money. You get into the business to, to get money. You will have nothing but problems, right? And it's like that with life. So I realized too many options. Like if you took your options right now, just got rid of everything, everything. And all you did was what had to be done to get to where you want to go and nothing else, no matter what, no matter what a year from now, you'd look around and you'd be like, there's nobody else around here except me. And you'd be crushing it. And you would lose friends. You would lose family members because they'd shit talk and hate on you because you are exposing their own lack of accountability and their weakness. Cause you are a mirror going, look at you ain't doing what you said you were going to do. Your life sucks. And you remind them of that every time you level up. That's why you get hate, which is why I said the barrier to entry for success is the hate you're going to get from the people that love you the most. Paralysis through analysis, mate, isn't it? I think all day, all day. It's embarrassing. You have to be willing to do what nobody else is willing to do to get what nobody else has. And very few people are willing to do that because they go, and people aren't afraid of failure. They're not. People are afraid of being seen to fail. And it's not the same. I fail all the time. I just get the fuck back up. Like when I wake up in the morning, I already know I'm going to win everything I do. I already know. And people go, that's pretty arrogant. I go, no, that's what, that's what, a, that's what a child says. That's what, that's what someone who with, without any intellect or self-worth says is that it's arrogant to think that you can't win everything. Yes, I can, because you can't beat anyone who refuses to quit. You can't. It's, it's impossible because they'll just outlast. It's not even a matter of winning anymore. It's just outlasting. But I mean, we I talk wake about up, that all the time. We talk about right? that all the fucking just time. Fucking outlast them. That's all. And it's listen, the three of us know it's no better time in history than it is right now to win. The competition is so low. There's no competition. Everybody's a fucking useless tit. Like they got nothing. So you just you mow over them. Just stay in the game. Just stay in. The, all you have to do is stay, you even, you don't even have to perform that well. The people that are winning right now. And I'm like, how are you winning? It's because there's no competition. The gladiators are all gone, right? The gladiators are all gone. So I, I look at this and I'm thinking, well, if you want to win, just stay in the game. If you want to win faster, do everything required and eliminate all your options and you will win. But you have to have a purpose. What's your purpose? Why do you want to do it? And most people wake up in the morning. They go, what can I take? What can I take from the world? Which is why they don't win. I wake up and I go, what am I going to give today? Everything I got. Because I don't get to do this again. I'm trading one 24-hour block for everything I do. Oh, I'm going to make it worth it. But I, before, I even, before I even climb out of bed, I stack wins. And people go, oh, gratitude. I go, no, wins. My heart beating. Yep. I won my house. have heat. Yep. I won. And people laugh and they go, dude, that's, that's fine. seriously. I go, why am I rich? And you're not, why do I have a great life? And you don't, why do, why do you complain about your life? And I don't, you might want to try what I'm doing because what I'm doing works, but people cover up laziness with disbelief. All right. Oh, it's not going to work for me. Yes, it will. You're not willing to do it. So I stack, I stack 20 wins before I even roll out of bed. And then I never miss like every morning. If you follow me on social media, I do the same thing every morning. I have missed this many times. I do the same pull-ups, air squats, push-ups, and bicycle twists every single I've seen that. morning. And I've never missed. You could look through it. There are hundreds and hundreds of days of me doing that. And I've had people go, are you just posting the same video? Do you ever look at what I'm wearing? Fucking twit. Yeah, you put on you put what? on your story, don't you? You put on your story, yeah. don't you? With some writing. Yep. Yeah, What's yeah, up? I've seen that. Yeah, every yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah yep, it's fucking it's incredible. I, 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 that's the first thing I noticed is every day he just does a workout. Every single bang, day, I never miss, and I always put cool. something in there. What my thoughts are? It's just my thoughts. But what's even crazier is 
the, the questions that people go, are you just reposting the same thing? That's you, man. That's your reflection that you are doing that because that's what you would do. Where I am, my wife and I walked around in Utah at a hotel when we were hanging out with, uh, with Goggins and the muscle and everything. And, and we're at this hotel Class. the night before, and I'm looking for a place to do pull-ups outside. It's like 20 degrees. I'm like, I don't care. I never fucking miss. But there's something to be said about that. Like I don't, these shirts, people laugh. They're like, how do I get a Spartan Army shirt? I go, never miss. But I don't. I wake up. You can set your watch by my routine because that's what allows me to win so often. Because your routine allows you to get, it gives you control. People, they get upset when it rains. Uh, You're controlled by something, right? People get upset when situations show up in their life. You're controlled. You want to control your life? Stack a routine. You know what people don't do? Control their thoughts. Try it one day. I told, I told people, I tell people all the time, try and control your thoughts for the whole day. It'll show you how little you control your thoughts and how much you used to. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do, but yet it's the easiest thing to do to change your life because thoughts become things, right? Thoughts become actions. Actions become things. Just keep doing that. You know, what people do is they set goals. You asked what can they do, right? About like young people and how they can be successful. Stop looking at where they don't want to go and use they, using that as an ambition to, to set goals. Because what happens is they go, I don't care. My parents were broke. We lived, we had the shitty car and lived in a crappy house. And, and there was, you know, it's like the, fucking Willy Wonka and we were Charlie Bucket in this house and whatever the hell life they had. And they go, I don't want that. So I'm never going to go. I'm never going to do that. So they keep looking at that and they use that as a motivating factor to go to where they want, but they wonder why they keep getting the shitty life. It's because they keep looking at it. You can't use what you don't like and what you don't want as a driving force for what you want. Because all it's going to do is bring more of that into your life because you are literally telling the universe, bring me more of that. You know, and, and so I think just decide what you want and then stop letting other people tell you not to do it. It's fucking amazing. Amazing, man. I feel so fucking motivated. It's unbelievable. Good. Good. <laughs> it's fucking, it's really cool. Good. I hope yeah, you got mate. something out of it. Oh, plenty, mate. And I'm sure our audience will as well. Where can people find you if they want to reach out and work with you, man? You can go to Smashworks anywhere. That's W-E-R-X. And if you type in Trevor Bachmeyer, you type in the Spartan, you'll show, I'll show up anywhere. But if you go to my Instagram, just go there. Smashworks, S-M-A-S-H, uh, yeah, uh, W-E-R-X. Just go there. Hit, hit me up in the message. It's actually always me. People go, Does it, is it really you? Yeah, it's me. Doesn't matter. I get probably 5,000 messages a day and I always answer. You can send me a DM. There's even my cell phone on there. You got a huge following. Uh, was it like 1.4 million on Instagram? Mm-hmm. Like how do you, yeah. how do you troll through that? Do you just go through it? Like spend half an hour and just be like, boom, boom, boom. My boom. notifications are on, on my phone <laughs> all the time. And I'll bet you right now, if I turn this on. Yep. So look at what's at the top notification <laughs> right there. If I swipe yeah. that up, you just give it a second. It'll show up. I get notifications nonstop. And, and, it's be- and I don't say that to impress anybody. I really don't. It's to impress upon people that you always have time. If you decide what you're doing is worth the time. But people go, but my distractions are worth my time. But when the distraction goes away, you're still in the same spot. So what are you doing? Right? If you don't like where you are and everything you've done up at this point has only brought you to where you are, why do you keep doing it? You know, and, and so, yeah, I answer people all the time, but I mean, we, my coaching, listen, the whole point about my business coaching program of the inner circle is to go from zero to a million dollars in a year. And I, I have 130, uh, 137. Now we just had somebody send me a message today, million dollar business in, in one year, 137 people. I've only been doing this program, my inner circle for 14 months. Nobody has a track record like me. Because nobody does what I do. And it's not meant to be arrogant. It's because I know what the fuck I'm doing. You know? And fitness, dude, just follow what I tell you to do. I'll get you jacked to shit. <laughs> right? But it's like people have to want to, right? And it's not motivating them to want to. It's telling them, here's the blueprint. And all they have to do is go back through my story and go, yep, he has documented from day one. Like even my pull-ups and everything, Danny, that you said you see every morning. Yeah. My first one was on with an oxygen tank attached to me, and I did one. <laughs> that's more than right? most still, mate. Yeah, mate. I was like, about to say that's more than fucking what? Like it's, it's crazy. Now I'm 52. Of people. Every day, 52 of them. 
That's amazing, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You're a mad man and a true spy, mate. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it, you guys. This is much love. This is a lot of fun, man. You guys are a good bunch, man. Like being here. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.